turn it on now. And so now tonight we're going to go beyond the fourth uh, trumpet and fourth vowel and go on to the, the three woes because these last three, it says woe, woe, woe. You know, you know all about woes, don't you? It's like I love that passage in Isaiah where he says woe unto this and woe unto that, you know, and woe unto the other. And he had a lot of woes. You ever notice that in one place in Isaiah? He had a whole lot of woes. It's quite interesting to look at it. But then God appears on the scene, and guess what Isaiah says? He has one more woe. Woe is me. <laughs> Amen. For I'm a man of unclean lips. So, you know, you can say woe this and woe that, but when God appears, <laughs> woe is me. And so, uh, but the angel said these, uh, woe unto the earth for these three last woes that are coming on the earth. So now we're going to see what happens under the fifth trumpet, which is Revelation 9, verse 1 to 12. Now you need to listen carefully to these two as we read. Thank you, Andrew. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it's commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither anything, ne any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, as many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and, and, they, and there were stings on their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which was the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is the Hebrew tongue, is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apol Apollyon, whose one woe is past, and the behold, there come two woes more. Okay, so that's the first woe of the last three trumpets. And uh, it all sounds pretty exciting. Some of it sounds a bit mysterious. But you don't have to worry about that. We're not looking into all the details of that at the moment. We're just going through the trumpets and looking at how they're parallel. Uh, it's unusual, you know. Some things the Bible we find hard to understand, but when the time comes, it clearly fits in. And the picture clearly fits in. Amen. For us. Okay, so you heard that. Isn't it interesting, too, that in that reading, it said that the only ones that weren't hurt were the ones that had the seal of God on their forehead. There's a picture under the tribulation, under the time of trouble, of divine protection. Amen? Those that had the seal of God were not affected. And the, the, the people that get the seal of God is under the seventh seal. They get the seal of God. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Right, okay, brother. Now you're reading the same... Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they um, guarded their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. What did you notice that was similar in those two? It was to do, yeah, and it was to do with the beast. It was to do with Satan. The bottomless pit, the seat of the beast. Amen? This is all to do with Satan. A little bit more hidden than the others. The others were obvious, earth, sea, river, sun. But this is still obvious because it's both. This is talked about the seat of the seat of the beast, and the um, the bottomless pit, which is all to do with satanic forces. Okay, so that's under the fifth seal uh, that we see here. I mean, sorry, the fifth trumpet and the fifth vial. We see that it was the seat of the seat, to do with Satan and the kingdom of darkness. Uh, there in both those readings, clearly speaking about that and giving us a different perspective of it. Okay, now we come to the sixth trumpet, and uh, just in case you haven't got the reference for that, let's go through it again, uh, is Revelation 9, verse 13 to 21, and then it's Revelation 16 for the veil, verse 12 to 14. 
verse 12 to verse to 14. Thank you, Andrew, if you'd like to read that for us again. And the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which was before God, saying to the six angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads, and with them they do hurt. Okay. Now that's interesting, isn't it? No wonder the Bible says in Psalm 91, Only with your eyes you behold the destruction of the wicked. Ten thousand will fall at one side and a thousand at the other. But no plague will come nigh thy dwelling. You see, the children of Israel, God put a difference between the children of Israel and the plagues on Egypt and the Egyptians. And God said, there came a point... And it's the same in the Revelation. There comes a point when the judgments will not affect God's people, but it will affect the wicked. That's what the Bible says. A lot of people are going to be saved during this time. The Bible says when God's cheap judgments in the earth, then will the people earn righteousness. But it talks there about a third part of the earth. And that's a lot of people. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> no wonder the Bible says God will shake everything that can be shaken. Only that which cannot be shaken will remain. And your reading? Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, Ethrates, and its water was... Just hang on a minute. Now, isn't that amazing? You can't deny that these run together. I don't know why people, when they put the thing on the end time, there's a lot of charts that have these things separate. This is talking about the river Euphrates. This is talking about the river Euphrates. It's identical, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Right, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Isn't that interesting? Because, you know, Armageddon hasn't happened yet. Armageddon out of here hasn't taken place yet. <laughs> okay. And this is almost at the end. This is almost just before the millennium. We're looking now at the seventh, sixth trumpet. And when does the first resurrection happen place? At the last trump. Or the seventh trumpet. Amen? The first resurrection takes place. And so both the sixth trumpet and the sixth vial are speaking about the river Euphrates. God couldn't make it plainer, could he? Amen? God couldn't make it plainer. It's talking about the river Euphrates and uh, what's going to happen there. There's some interesting things in that, which we're just going through, having a quick look at this. We're not talking about it, but it's very interesting, some of the things that are said there about the river drying up and so forth, the ways of the king's east and so on. <clears throat> okay, now, the seventh trumpet, which is the last trumpet. Uh, Revelation 10, 7, and Revelation 11, verse 15 to 19. And then the vial is Revelation 16, verse 17 to 21. This is your last trumpet. And this is the last, it's after the sounding of the last trump that the, the first resurrection takes place. You know, So for anyone to say that we're going to be out of here before there's any trouble, they don't know the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. I talked to a pastor in New Zealand. I won't say what church he was pastoring, but a large church and uh, who believed in the rapture before the tribulation. And he, um, I told him, well, I said, when does the Bible say it's going to happen? And we looked at the, showed him a few scriptures about the last trump, the seventh trumpet. The dead in Christ rise first. And then talked about the first resurrection. He said, I never thought of that. I said, well, you're going to look what happens under the seven trumpets. There's a lot of things happening and we're still here. Well, that's what it says in Psalm 42 and Psalm 91. You'll see it happening. You'll be here but God has divine protection. Okay, now this is an exciting one. I like the last trumpet. 
and the last bow. I think it's exciting. Thanks. Revelation 10, 7. Yes. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the seventh angel sounded, and there, was a, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. For the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell before, upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations are angry, and thy wrath is come, in the time of the dead that they should be judged, and they that just should, and they that thou should servants, uh, should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which should destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened up in heaven, and there was seen in the te- in the temple of the ark his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Oh, isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. And the keynote word that's used there is that it is finished. It is finished. Amen? Okay, now the seventh vial, which runs parallel to the trumpet. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there was noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as mighty and great earthquake, as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the furnace of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about a weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Now something? Greatest earthquake the world's ever seen is going to take place under the seventh trumpet. And uh, you notice there that both those references, the seventh trumpet and the seventh Baal, is talking about heaven, things happening in the heavenlies, God's throne. But the key words in those two things is, it is finished, it is done. Amen? Same thing. It is finished, it is done. You see, that's the mystery that God talks about, which we talked about a couple of studies back, you might remember. And, uh, and so uh, <coughs> that's, that's exciting to see what God's doing there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a run through, which we haven't done in this particular series of studies, on the, uh, the day of the Lord and the time of trouble. So you can just see how these things do run parallel in the scriptures. We're going to take a bit of a look at this and, uh, and see what God's saying. When, this, when we come down, I did write it down here, but when we come down to the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial, it says, it is finished, it is done. The kingdoms of this world have become the kings of the Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished, because he'd done what he had to do. Amen? And when God sounds the seventh trumpet, God can say, it is finished, it is finished, it is done. Amen? God's going to usher in his millennial kingdom at that time. The first resurrection will take place. The dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. And we will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Isn't that fantastic? And then will happen the resurrection of the unjust after a thousand years when they will be judged. And, uh, <clears throat> and all of that's going to take place right there. So we're going to just continue through now and just take a bit of a look at some important things <clears throat> that happen. We've seen what happens there by running through the seven vials and the seven trumpets. But now I just want to have us a bit of a look at some of the references of some of the things that God's going to cause to take place during that time. It's called, one of the things that this time is called, the standing of the seven trumpets, is the day of his wrath. You remember, if you turned, if I just turned to it and read it for you to save time, but in Revelation, when it talked about the sixth seal, just to remind you, it tells us there what the wicked are saying. And that's the beginning of the sounding of the trumpets. But this is what they're saying. Listen to it. In verse 12 of chapter 5 of Revelation, you know, if you put what I show you next week, and if you put this in, in the book of Revelation, you, you have a greater understanding of the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation runs to the end a few times. But when you tie these things together, you'll see so clear. Now, here's what they're saying. And I beheld, when he opened the sixth seal, oh, there was a great earthquake, not as great as the one under the seventh trumpet, 
But there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell under the earth, even as a tree cast for untimely figs, which is shaken of a mighty wind. And uh, the kings of the earth, it says in verse 15, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now here's all the wicked, the chief men saying, and what do they say? Verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? We talked in a previous study about those that will be able to stand. Amen? The great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That was under the sixth seal, which is just before the trumpets begin to sound, which is the time of the Lord, the day of the Lord, or the day of his wrath. I'm going to give you scriptures, well, some of them will go through fairly quickly, some of the scriptures, just, just a few, there's so many, relating to the, the day of wrath. It says in Job 20, 28, the day of his wrath. It says in Job 20, 29, the, is the, uh, this is the portion for the wicked, that's the next verse, from God. That's interesting. Job tells us, Job has a lot of things on the end time. Job tells us that the day of wrath is the portion of the wicked. Isn't that interesting? See, the day of the wrath is the sounding of the seven trumpets and the seven vials, and, and Job tells us way back there, it's the portion for the wicked. What does God say? Only with your eyes we behold the destruction of the wicked, but no plague will come nigh thy dwelling. That's why it's good to be a Christian, isn't it? Amen? Amen? You know, I, I was reading Spurge, Charles Haddon Spurgeon the other morning, and he was saying it's important for preachers to preach about the end time because it helps to put the fear of God in people. And he said, when the Apostle Paul talked about the end time, the judgment to come to Felix, the Bible says he trembled. He trembled. Amen? So it's good for us to look at these things. And so, the, so God says he hasn't appointed us to wrath because Christians are not appointed to wrath. Amen? But Job tells us way back there, it's the day of his wrath, Job 20, 28, this is the portion of the wicked men from God. And the, 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 the portion appointed to him by God. So God's wrath is going to come on the wicked. Okay. And you'll notice this is interesting. Now, next verse, verse 30. Very clear teaching here in Job. It's the next chapter. Job 21, 30. That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be for, brought forth to the day of wrath. Isn't that amazing, Job? The wicked are going to be, be in God's wrath, which is the day of wrath. No wonder Job said when he died, that you would remember me and r bring me up after your wrath, <laughs> not before it. Amen. He wasn't looking for a rapture before the wrath. He said, after the wrath, bring me up in the first resurrection. The first resurrection comes after God's wrath. He said, appoint me a time, remember me. Okay, we looked at that re a while back in the study room, but Job had a lot of insight, didn't he? He says in Psalm 110 verse 5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. The day of his wrath. What did it say in Revelation? The, the kings of the earth said the day of his wrath has come. See how it all ties in together? Who shall abide it? The kings of the earth said. And here, way back in the Psalms, it says, you shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Now, one of the Bible says, man's hearts will fail into fear for the things coming on the earth. Amen. And this will come. And it will come after a time of peace. So everybody will think it's all wonderful and suddenly it will hit the earth. Pull, pull, pull. It will start to happen. Okay. It says in Psalm 110, verse 6, the next verse, The kings of the earth, the day of his wrath, he shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. There again, it's talking about dead bodies. One should be taken, the other left. Where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Amen. We looked at that. In Proverbs 11, 4, Riches profit not in the day of wrath. Money won't buy your way out of this. Money won't help you. doesn't matter how much money you got. You can't buy your way out of God's wrath, can you? But righteous shall deliver, deliver from death. Righteousness shall deliver from death. And, and a bit further down, the same chapter, Proverbs 11, verse 8. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. Now, we saw what that deliverance was, didn't we? When we looked at Daniel 12, it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and again, Bendigo were delivered. They went through the fire, they were in the fire, but they were delivered, amen? Didn't mean to say they were taken out of it, but they went through it 
and we knew the delivering power of God in the fire. Amen? And so here it says, the righteous is delivered. Hallelujah for that. Isaiah 13 verse 6, How are ye for the day of the Lord? Notice we've got the term here, the day of the Lord. The day of wrath, the day of the Lord just run together. The day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, next verse, shall all hands be faint, and every heart's, every man's heart shall melt. Exactly what the Bible says in Luke. Men's hearts will fail them for fear for the things coming on the Lord. Next verse, down just a bit further, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord. See, the day of the Lord is a term that God uses again and again. In fact, to be quite honest, I, I, the word great tribulation is only used about three times in the Bible. And not all of those times it's referring to this. So the more accurate terminology for the end time, thank you, brother, is the day of the Lord. That's a term that's used so much. This judgment that's coming on the earth is the day of the Lord. Amen? It's God's divine judgment on the earth. You've got to understand that. It's not necessarily men having a big nuclear war and fighting each other. It's God intervening in the affairs of men and God bringing his divine judgment on the earth. Okay. So here it says, Behold, Isaiah 13, verse 9, The day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy what out of it? The sinners thereof, out of it. The one shall be taken, the other left. The sinners will be taken by God's judgment. The righteous will be left. That's what the Bible's talking about. We talked about that more extensively in a previous study. Isaiah 13, 11, I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I'll cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Seems like it doesn't pay to be proud in the last days. Verse 13, Therefore I'll shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. That's going to do something. The earth's going to remove. Job said God's going to take hold of the ends of the earth and shake the wicked out of it. So when God says I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken, only that which cannot be shaken will remain. I'll shake the heavens and the earth shall move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And Ezekiel 7.17, all hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be weak as water. Terrible. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. You know that they're saying here in the last days, you notice how they say a lot in the last days, put your money into silver and gold? Because that's secure, you know. Don't put your money in that. Put your money into gold. Put it into silver. But when this happens, that's not going to help. The Bible says they cast their silver into the streets. You know, it's amazing. I just saw that a while back on a financial thing. Put your money into gold. Even though gold's a bit low at the moment, this, this fellow was saying, put your money into gold. Put it into silver. That's the only secure place you can put your money. Well, that's not what the Bible says. They'll cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall not be able to deliver in the day of the wrath of the Lord. The day of God's wrath. Silver and gold will not deliver you. You've got to be a little bit like Peter. Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. That's something powerful, isn't it? Amen? We'll, we'll, we'll have that. Okay. In Zephaniah 1 verse 14, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. Every reference to the day of the Lord is tying it in with it this, this time. Uh, and, and that day, verse 15, that day is a day of wrath. And notice it brings in another term, a day of trouble. I wrote down there, time of trouble. Uh, in Daniel 12, Michael stands up, a time of trouble like the earth's never known. It's the day of the Lord's wrath. It's a time of trouble. Day of wrath, a day of trouble, a distress, a desolation. A day of darkness, it's often called, and thick darkness. You've got to recognize that during this time of the day of the Lord's wrath, there's going to be darkness. Now that's interesting too because so much is parallel with Revelation with Exodus. We're not looking at that now, but it's so much parallel with the plagues on Egypt. And what was one of the things that happened in Egypt? They had darkness. They were so thick it could be felt. But you know what the Bible says, and we'll look at this later on. The Bible says the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. Amen? Maybe we shouldn't look at it later on. Maybe we just look at it now. I'll just go turn to it right away. Look at, listen to this. If you just want a promise for the end time. Isaiah, I'm going to read out of Isaiah. Uh... Listen to this. Now, the children of Israel had light in their dwellings, yet the darkness was so thick it could be felt. So for the Egyptians it was darkness. For the children of Israel it was light. Amen? And when God talks about the day of the Lord, many, many times it talks about thick darkness, gross darkness, which I wrote down the bottom there. These are all things talking about the day of the Lord. Listen to this. 
this gets me excited, this scripture, but listen to this. This is talking about the end time too. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Because that's what we're going to see. The glory of God is going to be revealed in his people. Amen. And when is it going to happen? For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. So there'll be this great darkness on the earth. Gross darkness, as we just read here, the thick darkness, and uh, gross darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles, which means the heathen, the heathen shall come to the light of the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Isn't that fantastic? Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory, because God says, As soon as thou lives, saith the Lord, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. See, you've got to realize it's not all negative. This is a time when, when as it says in Thessalonians, when Jesus is, going to, Jesus is going to be glorified, when he comes to bring this time of trouble, is a judge the ungodly for all the ungodly deeds, he's going to be glorified in his saints and admired in all them that believe. And he's going to judge all those that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and all the disobedient and the ungodly, the ungodly, it mentions again and again. So there you see the parallel. The children of Israel had light in their dwellings and the Egyptians felt the thick darkness. Amen? So there you go. We, we slip back into that right then. And, and so there's a day of trouble, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of thick darkness. And I, Zephaniah 117, I'll bring distress upon men because they've sinned against the Lord. Zephaniah 118, neither their silver. Zephaniah is saying the same thing as Ezekiel, same thing as Isaiah. Neither their silver nor their gold. It's amazing to me that men today say, put your money into silver and gold. And But when you read the Bible, isn't it, we're living in the end times, aren't we? Because men said, put it into silver and gold, you know, uh, and so forth. I, I've got my own silver. You know, I had a guy want to buy my books and he gave me some silver that was I found out was a lot, a lot worth a lot more than the books were. But he said, I want to buy you which Bible can we trust you? I've got no money, but I'll give you these two coins. I found out they're quite valuable. But they're solid silver and pressed in America, put out by the mint in America. Fairly heavy pieces of silver, great big coins like this, which I still got at home. Silver, you know. So I got my piece of silver, but not, <laughs> not for that reason. I'm ready to, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Neither this silver, neither anyone got their gold. Anyone got their gold? God bless you. I see the hand. You may take it down. Okay. Neither their silver nor their gold should be able to deliver them the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. And he shall make a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Amen. Now, one of the Bible says a third part of the earth will die. And, uh, and then it says, Romans 2, 5, even in the New Testament. But after that, thy, thy hardness, Apostle Paul speaking, thy treasures, heart treasures up thyself, wrath against the day of wrath, and the revelation of the righteous judgments of God. Amen. Okay. And so there we see, as it says in Revelation 6.17, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who should be able to stand? Here's just a few more scriptures about the day of the Lord. Isaiah 2.12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud. Notice the proud get talked about a lot here, and lofty. Everyone that's lifted up, he should be brought down low. Upon every high tower and every fence wall, once again pride. And upon all the ships of Tarshish, they were the posh ships, and all the pleasant pitches, nice pitches. No pleasant pictures. And uh, the loftiness of men, you know, but it's interesting how the old preachers used to be about pleasant pictures, you know. They, uh, like D.L. Moody, I think I've told you this so many times, but Ira Sankey, they put his page, the great revival preacher, Ira Sankey's picture took the whole half page of the Glasgow Times when D.L. Moody was having his great revival meetings there. The next day, a photographer jumped behind a bush and took a photo of D.L. Moody. Now, a lot of evangelists today, and some preachers say, man, that's me. That's just what my campaign that campaign needs, is a picture of me. You know, we push so much the image of man today, don't we? But they were so careful in those days to give God the glory, you know. And a lot of evangelists would say, that's exactly what I need. What are you going to do with my picture? Oh, we're going to put it on the front page of the Glasgow Times. That's fantastic. Take about 10. I'll pick out the best one. You know, <laughs> this is going to be great for my crusade. Can you run it for a week, perhaps? You know, you know, you know what I mean? But what did D.L. Moody do? You see, that, that's why they had revival, because they had humble spirits. D.L. Moody took a hold of the photographer by his shirt, they tell me, and shook him and said to him, what are you going to do with that picture? He said, tomorrow it's going to be on the front page of the Glasgow Times. You know what D.L. Moody said? See that you do it not. But not. He was quoting a scripture. 
out of Revelation, where the angel worshipped. John Rich worshipped the angel. The angel said, see that you do it not. He said, see that you do it not, as he shook the photographer. And then the photographer said, why? Why not? Lest they worship the creature more than the creator. And, uh, and that came out of Romans. That's out of Romans, worshipping the creature more than the creator. And so, that, of course, his photo wasn't on the front time. The man wouldn't dare put it on the front page after being shaken around like that by D.L. Moody. But see, we, a lot of men today wouldn't act like that, you know? They say, fantastic, me, that's just me, all over the front page, that's so wonderful, you know? That's not the way God's going to work in the last days. He said, uh, the high towers, the pleasant pictures, the loftiest man should be down, down, the haughtiest man should be made low, and the Lord alone should be exalted that day. So that shows us we better get rid of the pride now. We better keep in the back now. We better not worry about getting nice pictures of us or, you know, pushing the image of man. Amen. Let's exalt Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. It's nice to know what someone looks like, as Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. It's nice sometimes when you get a book to have a little picture of the guy so you know what he looks like. You want to put a, pic, a face with a book sometimes. But he said it shouldn't go any further than that. Shouldn't go any further than that. You know? Amen. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> And it says in Isaiah, Isaiah 2.19, this reads exactly like Revelation. Revelation. In fact, I'll turn up Revelation so I can just show you this. It's just all the way through. I'll just, so I can just sit across to my Bible and I need to do that. Um, it won't be long. But here, Isaiah 2.19, they shall go into the holes of the rocks, in the caves of the earth, for the what? For the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Now, what did they say? Just so you can just get your mind refreshed again under the sixth seal. And when he'd opened the sixth seal, it says here, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, I'm reading Revelation now, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Why? For the great day of his wrath has come. That's under the sixth seal. And here, the Bible's saying in Isaiah exactly the same thing. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Because he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. Amen? They'll go into the clefts, next verse, 21 down a bit. They'll go into the clefts of the rocks, into the, into the tops of the rugged rocks, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. That's amazing. That's talking about the day of the Lord. And then you howl you for the day of the Lord. We read that before, Isaiah 13, 6. Isaiah 39, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. We read that before also, but there's many references to the day of the Lord. Isaiah, Jeremiah 46.10, For this is the day of the Lord God. Ezekiel 13.5, The day of the Lord. Talking about the judgment again. Um, and so forth. The day of the Lord, Ezekiel 33, It's the time of the heathen, called the day of the Lord again. And so on. And so there's many, many references, more than I can read to you. On the day of the Lord, it just runs through the Bible so many times. And so, um, I want to go down a little bit further here. Oh yeah, now this is the interesting thing. I can see from the indication of scriptures that there's going to be a lot of people saved during this time. Don't think for one moment. The Holy Spirit is not taken from the earth before the tribulation. Amen. We haven't dealt with that yet, but he's not. And there's going to be a lot of people saved because what does the Bible say? When God's judgments are in the earth, then will the people learn righteousness. Amen? So then will the people learn righteousness. And that's true, isn't it? So a lot of people are going to be saved because under the, uh, under the seals, they say, uh, you know, Lord, how much longer? Those that have been martyred in the past. And the Lord said, well, uh, I've still got a lot more to bring in. And there's going to be people even beheaded during this time. So that's nice, isn't it? They'll be saved. And so there's going to be a lot saved. And what does the Bible say here? Uh, <clears throat> that's why we need to know how to get the seal of God in our forehead. Amen? Okay, now I'm going to read Joel. Because Joel has a lot to say about the end time. It's kind of interesting what he says. And he uses the same term. All these prophets live hundreds of years apart, some of them, but they use the same term. Joel 1.15, Alas, for the day of the Lord is at hand, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Same thing. Destruction from the Almighty. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, Joel 2, 2. Um, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people. The earth shall quake, it says in verse 10. The moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining. Verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. The day, for it is the day of the Lord. It's a great and very terrible, and who can abide it? 
Who can abide this day, Joel says? It's great and very terrible. Amen? Maybe Joel said, I don't want to live then. I'm glad I'm living back here. No, it's a, it's a good day to be alive. Amen. The ends of the earth are upon us. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, Joel 2. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. The moon into blood. That's rather interesting. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered at that time. Let the heathen be wakened. You notice too that under the judgment when you read those trumpets and the vials, the Bible says they repented not of their deeds. The fact that it says that, there's room and time for repentance even in here, if you want to. Amen? But some are so hard like Pharaoh that nothing will make them repent. Amen? Nothing will make them repent. Not even this judgment that God's shaking the earth with will make them repent. They'll harden their heart. Isn't it incredible that men can do that? Harden their heart against God as it says in Revelation, and they repented not of their deeds. But nevertheless, in this great shake up, a lot of people are going to be saved. And the world population has never been so great. So what a great harvest. Time for God. Amen. As he comes to shake the earth terribly, and men's hearts are failing for fear. See, a lot of people come to God through distress. A lot of people come to God through, through um, financial pressure has brought a lot of people to God. Sickness has brought people to God. Amen? Now, you know, Alan Bond, he did all sorts of things with people's money, end up in jail in Western Australia. And how church, and another church used to get, we, even when I was there, I, I used to love going to the prison. We had a prison, prison ministry and I used to love going up there. A lot of got saved. And uh, during our prison ministry time, righteousness. Amen? So then will the people learn righteousness. And that's true, isn't it? So a lot of people are going to be saved because under the, uh, under the seals, they say, uh, you know, Lord, how much longer? Those that have been martyred in the past. And the Lord said, well, uh, I've still got a lot more to bring in. And there's going to be people even beheaded during this time. So that's nice, isn't it? They'll be saved. And so there's going to be a lot saved. And what does the Bible say here? Because Joel has a lot to say about the end time. It's kind of interesting what he says. And he uses the same term. All these prophets live hundreds of years apart, some of them, but they use the same term. Joel 1.15, Alas, for the day of the Lord is at hand, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Same thing. Destruction from the Almighty. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, Joel 2.2. 2. Um, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people, the earth shall quake, it says in verse 10, the moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining. Verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. The day, for it is the day of the Lord. It's a great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Who can abide this day, Joel says? It's great and very terrible. Amen? Maybe Joel said, I don't want to live then. I'm glad I'm living back here. No, it's a, it's a good day to be alive. Amen? The ends of the earth are upon us. <laughs> Glory to God. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. The moon into blood. That's rather interesting. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered at that time. Let the heathen be wakened. You notice too that under the judgment when you read those trumpets and the vials, the Bible says they repented not of their deeds. The fact that it says that, there's room and time for repentance even in here, if you want to. Amen? But some are so hard like Pharaoh that nothing will make them repent. Amen? Nothing will make them repent. Not even this judgment that God's shaking the earth with will make them repent. They'll harden their heart. Isn't it incredible that men can do that? Harden their heart against God, as it says in Revelation, and they repented not of their deeds. But nevertheless, in this great shake-up, a lot of people are going to be saved. And the world population has never been so great. So what a great harvest. Time for God. Amen? As he comes to shake the earth terribly, and men's hearts are failing for fear. See, a lot of people come to God through distress. A lot of people come to God through, through um, financial pressure has brought a lot of people to God. Sickness has brought people to God. Amen? But, you know, in a time of trouble, people have got time. I mean, when would Alan have time to sit down and listen to that sort of thing when he was a big-time entrepreneur with America's Cup and all the stuff? Where would you have time to sit down and listen to a little group coming in from a church doing a Bible study? But, you know, you're up there in the prison, and he used to come regularly to the Bible study. And he was under the word. Amen. 
and so you know God's gonna God's gonna shake pe things and and when men are getting shaken they will often turn to God they will often turn to God and so we're going on with Joel and it says uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered and saved uh, let the heathen be wakened Joel 3 12 and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat for there I sit to judge all the heathen round about put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe coming down for the press is full the vats overflow for the wickedness is great see when the cup of iniquity gets full that's when God says it's enough and God comes down and judges multitudes multitudes Joel 3 14 says in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is is, is near in the valley of decision amen multitudes multitudes the sun shall be darkened and the reddish stars shall withdraw their shining very next verse so that's when there's multitudes in the valley of decision the Lord shall roll out of Zion and utter his, utter his voice from Jerusalem heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people isn't that wonderful in the middle of the shaking God says the Lord will be the hope of his people the strength of his people okay Amos gets real straight with it here we're going from Joel now and Amos we're looking at the minor prophets now about the day of the Lord Amos is he's may Amos just lays it out Amos 5 8 he says woe to you that desire the day of the Lord <laughs> and you like it he says woe to you that desire the day of the Lord <laughs> well of course that would be right for some people one you that desire the day of the Lord to what end is it for you the day of the Lord is darkness and not light see here Amos is talking about the people that think they're Christians but they're not woe to you that desire the hypocrites Show that Amos 5:20. Show that the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, and even very dark and no brightness in it. But we know that God said His light shall come. But there is a time of darkness, and that's right. Now that's Amos. You can just go through these prophets. They all talk about it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel. Now we're going to Amos. Now we're Obadiah. Just a little book with one chapter. Obadiah verse 15. It says, "For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen." Same thing. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Amen. Hallelujah. And then it says in verse 18 of Obadiah, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for stubble, which speaks of the wicked. And saviors, verse 21, Saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's, our, that's, that's the judgment of the house of Esau, which is the house of the wicked. And God says in Obadiah, Then the kingdom shall be the Lord. Obadiah is just saying in another way, of what happens under the seventh trumpet the kingdoms of this world have become the king of our Lord his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever amen hallelujah isn't that incredible saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau that's the wicked and the kingdom shall be the Lord's Sephaniah another book he says I'll utterly consume all things from off the land Sephaniah 1 2 verse 3 I'll consume men and beasts I'll consume the fowls of the heaven the fishes of the sea which we saw under the, under the trumpets and bowels, the stumbling blocks with the wicked, I'll cut off men from off the land, saith the Lord. Sephaniah. And, I, and then he goes on in verse 4, talks about some more of his judgments. Uh, it's all cut them asunder, this stuff. I'll cut off the remnants of Baal from their place, and them that worship the host of heaven, and them that swear by the Lord and swear by Matcham, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and them that are turned back from the Lord. See the backslider. Them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord. A Christian that just wants to just nully wally around and not get into the river. He doesn't seek God. Them that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. And all those people are going to be judged. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord for the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord, Sephaniah 1, 7. Okay, is at hand. So they're all saying the same things, aren't they? When you talk about the day of the Lord. Okay. In Sephaniah 1.14, the great day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is at hand. That's what it told us there. It's the day of wrath, verse 15. And this is interesting. I want you to notice something. I wrote the day of the wrath, day of the Lord, time of trouble, darkness. But look, look how Sephaniah, when he talks about it, puts it all together here for us. He says in Sephaniah 1.14, the great day of the Lord is near. And then he says again in the same verse, the day of the Lord. And then he says in the next verse, the day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of wasteness, a day of darkness, and thick darkness. He lays it all out for us just in those two verses there very clearly for us. And then in Sephaniah 3.8, it 
It says, uh, it talks about again, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire, which Peter talked about. Okay, so he's talking about that. Zechariah talks about it. Zechariah. In fact, Zechariah's kind of got some comforting words. Because remember how I said God will deliver you? God will bring you through this? And I talked about how that he judged the earth with a flood, but in the end time it's with fire. Well, look what Zechariah's got to say here. Tremendous promise. This, these are the sort of scriptures that Corrie ten Boom was talking about, who believed the church would go through the tribulation. Corrie ten Boom says, take these scriptures on the end time about God's protection in the day of tribulation and, and remem memorize them because you'll need them one day. Amen. These are good scriptures. Okay, now look at Zechariah. Zechariah 13, verse 8. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts thereon shall be cut off and die. So two parts will be cut off and die, but a third part shall be left therein. Amen. So I wonder what the third part is. What's the two parts that's cut off? And what's he going to do with the third part that's left? Verse 9. I'll bring the third part through the fire. Amen. Isn't that incredible? See, the, the third part there is the Christians. I mean the fair Jenkins Christians. And God says, I'll bring the third part through the fire. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego went into the fire, but didn't affect them. And what happened was they saw Jesus walking around in the fire with them. Amen. And I'll bring the third part through the fire. Hallelujah. Let's see what else happens. Uh, verse 9. The third part through the fire. We find the servers refined. We'll try them as gold is tried. They shall call my name. They shall call on my name. <laughs> we won't have any trouble praying then, amen. They shall call on my name. And I'll hear them. Isn't that great to know God says, I'll hear them. I'll hear them and I'll say, it is my people. <laughs> God will say, these are my people. The third part that's left, I'll destroy two thirds, but a third will be left. One, two parts of the third will be left. And the, 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 my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. What does Psalm 42 say? Oh man, we've got to read that. This is talking about the end time. No, this doesn't. We've talked about it before, but come on, I've got to read you this. This is so exciting. Psalm 91 and Psalm 42 are good psalms to, like Corrie ten Boom said, to rememberize for the end time. Psalm 42, uh, sorry, uh, it's um, not Psalm 42. No, no, the other Psalm, 46. God is our refuge and very strength and help in present help in trouble. Therefore will not fear, but man's hearts will fail for fear, though the earth be removed. That's enough to make you fear. But God says we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, we won't fear. Why? The waters thereof shall roar and be troubled, the mountains shall shake with the swelling thereof. Why won't we fear? Because there is a river, hallelujah. The streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right egg. And as that's what it's saying here in, in Zechariah, they will call and God says, I will hear. Isn't that wonderful? They will call. And that right early. What's going to happen? That's what's happening to the righteous. What about the heathen? The heathen raged. The kings were moved. The other's voice, the earth melted. But what's the righteous going to say? The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Come and behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he's made on the earth. And he is making desolations in the earth. Amen. And then they finish up the psalm by saying, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. But in Psalm 42 and Psalm 91, it says you're going to see it happening. You're going to behold the desolations that God makes in the earth. And I, don't you love the Bible? Don't you love it? Amen. God's saying here in Zechariah about what God's going to do. I'll bring a third part through the fire. I'll hear them. And, they, they'll, and I will say it's my people. And they will say the Lord is my God. Behold, and he goes on to say in Zechariah 14, 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Cometh. Okay. And Malachi even talks about it. The last of the minor prophets, Malachi 4 or 5 says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He calls it the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Even Acts talks about it. In Acts 2, 20, The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord comes which is the day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass, next verse, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that fantastic? See, multitudes are going to be saved. A lot of people are going to be saved during that time. Hallelujah. Because there won't be much else you can trust in. There won't be much else you can look to. The money is not going to be any good. The silver is not going to be good. 
Don't worry about the exchange rate then. It won't even be exchange rate. <laughs> you won't have to worry about looking at your TV and then you wouldn't want to look at it if you could look at it. Okay. So there you go. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord's day cometh as a thief in the night. And, and we're going to deal with that thief in the night too on this series on the end time because it's important we know. You know, we think, oh, people, well, we'll talk about that another time. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Upon who? The wicked. Sudden destruction cometh upon them. It's going to be quick. But you brethren, amen, are not in the darkness, Paul said, that that day should come upon you, overtake you as a thief. Amen? amen. See, some people say, oh, the rapture's going to come like a thief in the night. No, that, that's the wicked that's going to come as a thief in the night. That day won't take you as a thief. You'll know. You won't be in darkness. The Bible clearly teaches that. But you, brethren, hallelujah, are you one of the Paul's brethren? You are not in the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Real Christians, it will not overtake you as a thief. Isn't that good news? Because you're awake and you're watching. But the Bible says he will come to as a thief in the night to the wicked and he will come as a thief in the night to the backslider and the hypocrite and the half-baked Christian. The Bible says that clearly. In the Bible, it says that clearly, okay. And so that's what it's saying. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. And that's going to suddenly come. And Paul, again, is talking about the day of the Lord as being a destruction, a sudden destruction that's going to come upon you. So don't you see you're all saying the same thing when you come to the day of the Lord all the way through? But he goes on to say in verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 5, 5, you're the children of the light. You're children of the day. We're not of the darkness. Amen. We need to learn what's coming on the earth. We need to be awake. We need not be sleeping. We need not rest in a false hope. We've got to come back to the Bible. Trouble today is people don't read their Bibles enough. We've got to come back to the Bible and find out what saith the Lord, amen, amen. about these things. We need to wake up. Amen. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Isn't that interesting Paul says that? In First Thessalonians 5, God's not appointed us to wrath. Hallelujah. This wrath that's coming on the earth, God hasn't appointed you to that. God can take you through it. And you can see what God's doing, but God can protect you in it. Amen. And we talked about that too in the previous study. So this is what God's saying here to his people. Okay. Now, even Peter talks about it. I'm going to have to stop soon, but you know, time will fail me. But Peter talks about it. Uh, first Peter, sec sorry, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord has not slack concerning his promise. You know, and, and people are mock. And, and Peter says people are going to mock in the last days. Say, where's the promise of his coming? So it will have been an exciting time, the after time, because you don't know when, you know, you know it's getting close. Man, it's breathing just up near you when God says after. And so Peter says, but, but when they say this, where's the promise is coming? Peter says in 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. See, he wants to save people. That all should come to repentance. Isn't he loving God? But verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come. That's this day. Amen? The day when the trumpets sound, the day when the vials are point, pointed on, poured on the earth, Peter said the day of the Lord will come. So you better believe it. If you don't believe this, you're going against Ezekiel, Elijah, Isaiah, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Peter, Paul, on and on the list goes. They all said it's going to come. Amen? The day of the Lord will come, Peter said, as a thief in the night. Suddenly it's going to come. In the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth shall also and the works that are there and shall be burned up. <laughs> God's going to bring us through the fire. Isn't that wonderful? See, then all these things shall be dissolved. <laughs> what manner of person ought you to be <laughs> in all holy conversation and godliness? Amen. Looking unto and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's Peter. In 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look, look for a new heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. A new heaven and new earth. That fire will be a purging thing like that, and God will just bring this earth into the millennium, and she's going to shine with God's glory through the millennial reign. Amen? Of Christ. Shine with God's glory. That's some of the things that God's saying to us, okay, about the end time and uh, what's going to be taking place. So I think, you know, 
we, we better uh, perhaps leave it there, but praise God, we have light. We're not children of the darkness. Amen. The rise shine, the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Hallelujah. And God's going to cause us to walk in the light. We're about there. 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 We're about there.